Teaching yourself to weld steel is a critical skill for fabrication and repair. Whether you're planning on building projects from start to finish, or just simply want to save some money by fixing parts instead of buying new ones. If you're new to the channel, then make sure to hit that subscribe button. You can find all parts linked in the description. And let's get started. In this video, we're going to cover MIG welding, which is the easiest welding technique out there for welding steel. We're going to explore the proper way of using one of these welders, as well as the wrong way to get a better understanding how MIG welding works. Starting off with the machine itself, which I bought almost 4 years ago. This machine proved itself to be quite reliable, having been able to modify an ordinary mountain bike into a powerful e-bike, build a roof out of rebar to mount a solar panel onto a golf cart, and much much more. Sure the original plastic handle failed after a while, but for under $10 at my local hardware store I was able to buy myself a metal handle and weld it on using its own power. This welder, unlike some of the older ones, can work with both 120 volts and 240 volts. I'll be using 240 volts since this enables us to have a longer runtime before it needs a break, as well as allowing us to use higher settings on the welder. The welder came with an adapter to go from a 120 volt to 240 volt plug, but I had to use another adapter to go from one kind of plug to the one on the wall. I made sure to keep the power off while doing this since I don't want to get electrocuted. 240 volt plugs need extra force because of the thicker contactors used for higher current capabilities. Before starting to weld, let me show you how MIG welding works. Inside the machine, I'm using a 0.035 inch roll of steel wire, which is on the thin side, but is still able to weld quite thick steel as you'll see later. This roll of wire is also the gasless type, which some say makes a mess compared to welding with shielding gas, but to my defense, it's very easy to clean up and gasless welding is also way easier to carry around, since you don't need to drag with you a tank that weighs nearly as much as the actual welder. The welding torch feeds wire to the metal you're welding, while the ground clamp has to be connected to the piece of metal to close the circuit. I'll start simple and weld these two pieces of metal. I'll put on welding gloves to prevent my hands from getting burnt from hot molten metal, as well as a welding helmet which acts as a face shield and also automatic sunglasses that switches on when it detects an intense amount of light. It also has a knob on the side for brightening or darkening your view if you can't see what you're doing. Trying to tack weld painted steel can be almost impossible unless you find an exposed section to heat up the wire which will then melt the paint, allowing you to start welding. Some people like to clean up the entire workpiece before even thinking about welding, but I usually tack weld the two pieces of steel and only then clean up the surface. I do this not only to save time, but also because the paint becomes easier to remove after the metal is warm from the tack weld. Some welders include metal brushes, but to speed up the process, you can just get yourself a rotary brush that can be attached to a drill in order to remove the paint in seconds instead of minutes. As we start welding, I do have to note that it takes some trial and error to get a nice looking weld. Immediately after finishing a weld using a gasless welder, you can clearly see some white residue called slag, which is a byproduct when welding with a gasless MIG welder since the metal wire contains flux, which substitutes shielding gas, but leaves a mess. No worry though, because as I mentioned earlier, it is very easy to clean up by using the rotary wire brush. And after a few seconds of brushing, we can have a look at the weld, which I have to say, it came out quite nice. Although I did lose track at some point, but I realized it immediately and returned straight to the center. There is also very little sputter, which is basically the tiny little balls of metal that is hard to remove with a brush and requires an angle grinder. 
When it comes to making the perfect weld, it's mainly about dialing in the right settings. Of course, most welders come with instructions on what to set it on depending on the thickness of the metal wire and the thickness of the metal you're welding, but for some reason, the voltage meter on my welder broke, so we're just going to have to mess around until we get the perfect weld. I'll go ahead and set the welding helmet to the grinding position, which will turn on the automatic sunglasses. I'm doing this because for most of the tests, I'll cut up an old worn lawnmower blade to get a more accurate comparison. Here we have a clean piece of metal clamped to the welder and sitting on a brick. On the welder we can see lots of knobs. The two most important ones are the voltage and wire speed knobs. The current knob controls the amperage, which can only be changed when stick welding. And the burn back knob doesn't seem to work on my machine, but is also not that critical. Setting the voltage too high or having the wire speed too low can result in not getting enough material on the metal. And in the worst case scenario, you can end up melting a tip, which you certainly want to avoid. Setting the voltage too low on the other hand, or having the wire speed too high, will feed the wire way too quickly and it won't have time to properly melt itself into the metal. Starting with setting up the welder with too high of a wire speed compared to the voltage. As soon as I started welding, we can see that it piles up a lot of steel, so I had to start moving fast. But welding too fast probably prevented the weld from penetrating the metal since it didn't have enough time to heat up. We're later going to have a better look at the weld, but for now, I'll remove all the slag from the metal to prepare it for our next test. For our next test, I'll lower the wire speed, leaving us with a high voltage to wire ratio. I won't go all the way down yet, since I don't want to melt my welding tip. Immediately we can tell that it sounds way smoother. But as we finish the weld, it is quite obvious that there is very little material added, so it wouldn't properly bond two pieces of metal. Seeing the previous weld, I think it might be safe to crank the wire speed all the way down and move up the voltage a little. As I start welding, we can clearly see the welder stopping to weld every second or so since the high voltage is melting the wire faster than it is being fed. This results for the distance between the wire and the steel to lengthen, making it temporarily impossible for the arc to jump. This weld came out to be similarly as thin as the previous weld, which is not a good weld at all, but as I said, we will have a better look in a minute. For the final weld on this piece of metal, I'll set the voltage right in the center and set the wire speed a little bit less than that, which works quite well for me. After beginning, we can hear how the weld is continuous and doesn't stop for anything. It also looks wider than the first weld, because by that one I was forced to move faster than this one. Now I'll slowly cool down the metal using some water. And yes, you have to be slow since you don't want to crack the weld by cooling it down too quickly. I'll go ahead and clean off all the slag as well as the loose sputter. From a top view, we can see that the weld on the right, which basically had a low wire speed to voltage ratio, doesn't look terrible at first. But if I cut it in half and flip it over to the side, it seems to be pretty much flat and not very strong. The one right next to it had an even lower wire speed to voltage ratio, which looks very close to the previous one, but as we look from the top, we see a large amount of sputter that was not able to be cleaned up by my rotary wire brush, so this one is the worst yet. Moving on to high wire speed to voltage ratio, we can see that it looks better than the two welds from before, but not as good as this weld, which is how a proper weld is supposed to look like. And from the side view, we can see how the high wire speed to voltage ratio caused the metal to build up excessively tall, since the higher voltage is responsible for melting the wire into the piece of metal. Next up, we're going to weld two horseshoes together, which are made of about half inch steel. For such thick metal, I'm going to max out my machine by bringing the voltage all the way up, as well as having the wire speed right under the maximum amount. I'll also go ahead and tack weld them together, and then brush off any rust or paint. 
When welding with the maximum settings, it is most practical to use a 240 volt outlet, because when I tried using such high settings plugged into a 120 volt outlet, I ended up only being able to weld for about 5 seconds before the circuit breaker trip. This is because using a higher voltage requires less current, which will not only prevent the breaker from tripping, but will also keep the machine running longer before it overheats. And after almost 3 minutes of welding, we can brush off all the slag to reveal the solid weld underneath. Now when it comes to welding thin metal, you want to use the lowest setting as possible, otherwise it'll just melt right through. I guess it can be an alternative to a grinder, but it leaves over a mess of wire for you to clean up afterwards. Anyways, I'll bring down the voltage and wire speed, and then attempt to weld two pieces of steel without melting through it. I'll take frequent breaks to let the sheet metal cool down. And as expected, here we have our first hole. As much as I tried, there is no way for me to stop the welder from blowing holes through the metal. In this case, the best technique would be to use a TIG welder, which doesn't rely on wire being melted. Instead, it melts the metal itself and you can then add the wire. But it is also way harder to learn and requires a shielding gas tank, which makes it less portable. If I apply some force, we can see that it does in fact bend, but not on the actual welds, which means that it came out solid. Now you might ask, can we weld stainless steel using steel welding wire? Well, let's find out. These sheets are slightly thicker than the ones from before, so it might have an unfair advantage. Just like before, I'm pulsing the trigger to let it cool down a little in order not to melt through it. And as we can see, there are no holes made by the welder. I tried again to weld, and this time I didn't stop and just kept moving. This resulted in a better weld, although I did burn a hole at the end. While stainless steel is very good at resisting rust, once you weld it with steel wire, it is not the case anymore and you'll have to waterproof it with some paint. But the question is, did the steel wire end up properly bonding the stainless steel sheets? As I start applying some force to the metal, which was pretty hard to do, you can see that it starts to bend, but once again, not on the weld itself, and it's bending on the stainless steel side. Have you ever wondered why we remove the paint from metal before welding? Well, let me demonstrate. Here we have two tack welded pieces of steel. One has a smooth finish, while the other one has a rougher finish. I'll go ahead and remove all the paint, but I'll leave one side as is. Because we are working with a thin-ish metal, I'll set the welder to a low-ish setting. I'll start with the painted section. As I'm moving along, I gotta say, it was constantly hesitating. My theory is that the paint acts as somewhat of an insulator, leading to unstable arcs. If you think it has to do with having a low voltage to wire speed ratio, then as I start welding in the bare metal section, you can see that it is way more stable. But I did end up blowing through the metal a few times, probably because the welder can apply more heat to the metal, since there is no paint to insulate the electrical arcs. I did manage to get a better weld with no holes by pausing every few seconds. After a quick polish, we can see that the weld that was done over the paint has holes in it. I'm thinking it's because the paint bubbled through it. And as we move along, we can see the weld that was done after properly removing the paint. And I have to say, they not only look way better, but also way stronger. I'll cut the welds in half to see how it looks from the inside. And after a quick polish, we can see the weld over the paint, which clearly has some holes in it. Moving along to the weld over the polished steel, it looks like a solid bead with little to no imperfections. When setting up a MIG welder to weld steel, using gasless wire, you have to make sure to always hook up the ground clamp to positive and the welding gun to negative. Wanna know why? Let's flip around the polarity and see what happens. It sounds pretty smooth, but I can immediately see some big pieces of sputter, which is never a good thing. It also seemed to burn a hole through the metal at the end of the weld. 
After polishing all the slag, we can have a look at the piece of metal. Now the weld itself does not look bad, but the fact that it burned through the hole at the end and left a lot of hard to remove sputter is unacceptable. If you think this has to do with the settings, then let me just flip back the polarity and weld another bead right next to this weld. I'm moving at about the same speed and you can immediately hear a difference. After the weld is complete, I gotta say, it is not the straightest weld I've ever done. But what is important is that it made little to no sputter and it also didn't melt through the steel. The final thing I'll do in this video is using the welder for something practical. This right here is a 125cc Chinese dirt bike that I purchased second hand for a very cheap price. And as you would expect, it came with some damage. Specifically, one of the engine mounts broke off which caused the frame to bend a little. Sure, I can leave it as is and forget about it, but at some point, the dirt bike frame might bend so severely that it might not be fixable anymore, or in the worst case, the engine might rip itself out of the frame, which can kill the person riding it. So to fix it, I'll insert a new bolt that is long enough to reach the other side, and my plan is to weld on a thick washer on both ends, to which I can then bolt on the engine. I will remove the muffler to be able to reach one side of the mounting bracket. I'll also remove the alternator cover so I should be able to push away these wires and prevent them from getting burnt. Now in this case we aren't gonna weld a lot so hooking it up to a 120 volt outlet will work just fine. I'll start by cleaning off the paint which as you saw earlier will lead to a better overall weld. I'll position the washer and give it a tack weld. Since I absolutely don't want the weld to burn through, I'll briefly pause the weld to let the metal cool down a little. As I'm brushing the metal to prepare it for the paint, I have to be very careful not to rip the wires. I'll do the other side as well and I ended up using a different kind of brush which made stripping the paint way easier. A crucial step to prevent rust from forming, which will compromise the metal strength over time, is to apply one or two coats of primer and paint in one spray paint after cleaning the slag off the weld. And after waiting 24 hours for the paint to dry, I bolted down the engine and put everything back together. And let's reward ourselves by having some fun. Man, I love dirt bikes. If you like this video, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and consider supporting this channel through Patreon so I can keep creating better and better videos. And I will see you guys in the next video.